Now, I sort of had kind of wanted to um, share a bit of, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the document that kind of went on to describe uh, Dr. Batten's um, contributions to astronomy uh, over 60 years or so. Um, and it took me three or four pages. <laughs> um, suffice it to say that, that, that um, it was a very, very accomplished gentleman, and this is a very uh, well-deserved award. I did kind of sneak a little bit out of it, so I'm just going to read just a little bit of, of the entire presentation, to, just so we kind of know that we're in the presence of greatness, if we didn't already know. <laughs> but throughout his DAO research career, Dr. Batten was an active life member of the Victoria Center, which continues to this day. He served as center president in 1972, and his most recent term as a featured uh, speaker was in December of 2015. His experience at the local level were then elevated to the national level, uh, level where Dr. Batten served as the RSC national president uh, from 1976 to 78, and then editor of the journal from 1980 to 1988, for which he was re recipient of the National Service Award in 1988. Uh, reading as many J. Rask's contributions on society affairs in those years provides unique insight into the evolution of Canadian astronomy. That 20 of his 89 uh, J. Rask contributions were published following the receipt of the 88 Service Award is testimony to his ongoing respect of and support for the Society's publications. That uh, support includes contributing uh, the nearest star section uh, to 40 editions of the Observer's Handbook, that's from 1970 to 2009. His appointment to a four-year term as Society's Honorary president, uh, president, from 1993 to 1997, highlights the Society's high regard for Dr. Batten. And it just goes on and on. There's just the most amazing uh, list of accomplishments uh, for do from Dr. Batten. So what I'll do is I'll just simply present you Fellowship Award from the uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Thank you very much.
Okay, so the basic components of an uh, exoplanetary system uh, is star itself, uh, and then a debris disk, which is usually some, some asteroid belt uh, that's clinically active, and then planets. And then you can also have uh, some, uh, some other external effects, like the ISM is, a, uh, is uh, the interstellar medium, so you can have dust uh, as the stars move, you can have other stellar neighbors, a stellar flyby can happen. Um, but these three components are what make up the planetary system. And we've sort of been studying them in isolation, right? Stars have been sort of the bread and butter of astronomy for, for a very long time now. Debris as we've discovered sort of in the 80s. Uh, and the planets have sort of taken off in the, in the millennium. Um, and so hopefully we can start learning about each of these components and then bring it back together and start learning about how does a planetary system actually evolve with time? Okay, so this is actually the first image of a debris disk. It's around Beta Pic. Uh, it was taken back in 1984. Uh, and it's a fairly simple image where they just took a chronograph, so it's just a, a block to uh, block out the central starlight. And then they image around it, and lo and behold, there's this emission that comes around uh, the star itself. Uh, and they didn't just get lucky and just start observing random stars. Uh, what they actually did is their sat infrared satellite, IRS, was able to look at the infrared spectrum uh, from space. And what they found is that there was these odd objects that had an infrared excess. Uh, and it was just associated with the star itself. It wasn't part of some background cloud uh, of the galaxy or anything. And so when you see this bump in excess, uh, it's, they thought, well, let's see what's there. Is it some uh, binary system or something? Uh, but then they found that it's actually this belt of dust that's around the star uh, that's uh, thermally mid. That's fantastic. So uh, debris disks aren't just uh, sort of the leftovers of planet formation. They aren't just the comets and asteroids. There's also a very important stirring mechanism that has to go into that. Uh, and so, in order to make them collisionally active, you have to have some sort of mechanism like a planetary stirring. The idea there is you have a planet that's perturbing uh, the, the asteroids and comets. So, if you think about like the Nice model where uh, Jupiter and Saturn migrated very rapidly, that caused the, the proto Kuiper belt to uh, get disrupted. So, then those bodies started colliding with one another, creating a lot of dust. You have a stellar flyby, uh, which, you know, it's hard to observe. I mean, you usually see the after effects, but if you have some star that went by a debris disk system that could influence it, cause them to go into collision with cascade. Uh, ISM interactions similarly pass through a cloud, it excites uh, the system. Uh, Self-stirring is an idea where uh, the planet formation just takes a really long time the farther you get out from the star. Uh, and so if it takes a really long time, then eventually you form like Pluto-sized bodies and then those bodies start interacting with other asteroids and comets, and then that kicks off a cascade. Okay, so uh, it's through one of those stirring mechanisms that then gives you um, uh, the dust that you observe. Okay, so one of the sort of misconceptions about the Redis is often in sci-fi movies, like in, in Star Wars, when you're Han Solo and you're trying to avoid the TIE fighters, and you're flying into this asteroid field. Uh, that's great and all, but uh, if the asteroids were actually that dense around some sort of star, they would be colliding quite often, right? And for every large asteroid, there's going to be tens of thousands or millions of smaller dust grain particles in there. So really, the analogy is more like we're sailing into a fog bank of just all this dust. And so when you observe in the optical and near infrared, what we're seeing is that light from the central star getting reflected off of the dust grain. So we just come back to this diagram again. Uh, the other main component is planets, obviously, right? The planetary system. Um, and for a long time, we've uh, observed predominantly through transits, right? It's sort of taken off, especially with Kepler. It's a very easy thing to do. And the basic idea is, is in this transit of Venus, right? You're seeing a planet go in front of, uh, of a star. Right? But it's not even this easy in that you don't actually see a nice shadow when you're seeing a, a dip in light. 
And so you're not really actually measuring the planet, the uh, planet's radius, right? What you're measuring is a relative ratio between the planet and the star itself. Um, and so it's, it's a, what's considered an indirect method. So uh, the indirect methods are very popular because they get a lot of candidates. You find a lot, a lot of them, but you don't measure a lot of good things about them. If you want to really understand the planet, all you've really measured is the radius, and then that's it. Right? So just to go over the basic methods, right? you have the transit method, you're measuring a radius or a relative radius. Uh, radio velocity method, you're measuring a relative mass, so a mass ratio between the planet and the star. And it's even worse then because it's uh, inclination dependent. So if you have a, a planet that's orbiting edge on, so it's the plane of the orbit is in the, in the line of sight of you as the observer, right? You can get the same signal from a lower mass planet that's edge on as a higher mass planet that's at a, uh, at a higher inclination. Right, so there's this inclination bias that you don't really know what the mass actually is. Right, but if you're lucky enough to observe in both transit and radial velocity, then you can actually uh, measure uh, a density, a rough density, and then sort of make some guess at, oh, it's a rocky planet, or it's a, a massive Neptune planet, or something like that. Um, astrometry is the other method, and this is probably the next method that's going to lead to a wave of discoveries of planets. Uh, the, it's very hard to do because what you're doing is you're measuring the wobble of the star in the position of the sky. And so you have to be very precise in, in your instrument to be able to actually measure a small fluctuation of the star's position based on a planet. Okay? Uh, but there's a satellite called Gaia, which the Europeans have launched, and it should be able to detect, uh, actually detect Jupiter mass planets around other stars. Uh, then there's this oddball of microlensing, and that one is very. Uh, very odd, mostly in the fact that you, there's no possibility for following these detections up. You, you get a nice detection and then um, you're relying on general relativity to, to bend the light so that you get a spike in, uh, in starlight from a background star and then it, there's a corresponding spike to when they're in overlap with the planet. Okay, so you can find uh, like Neptune mass planets at wide separations, which a lot of these methods aren't sensitive to. Uh, but uh, they're usually detected towards the bulge, uh, where there's a high density of stars, so there's a high probability of such an event occurring. And it's, it's very far away, uh, the likelihood of, of doing uh, astrometry goes down, uh, radio velocity, you often get confused uh, by having to go through dust towards the galactic bulge, and transits, you again have to be lucky that it's edge on. Right, so, this is why direct imaging is really the way to go. We want to actually be able to see the planet and measure things about the planet. Uh, and that's exactly what uh, GPI is designed to do. Uh, so here on the left, this is a fully reduced image of Beta Pig B. So that star I showed you before that had this debris disk, uh, it also has a planet around it. And see image right here. And this has been known for a while now uh, with previous direct imagers. Um, but the one thing that uh, we really want to do uh, with a survey is to uh, be able to test planet formation mechanisms, right? And planet formation mechanisms come in, in two main flavors, and that's cold start models and hot start models. Uh, and so hot start models are as they sound, they, they form a planet when it's really hot. And usually those are mechanisms where uh, you have a gravitational instability, that's a rapid collapse or you have uh, a pressure bump from gas that causes dust to coagulate really quickly. Uh, and so if you, if you form the planet embryo really quickly, it'll stay very hot and it has a, bad, a hard time dissipating that heat. Whereas if you uh, form the, the planet embryo very slowly, it has time to dissipate heat and so it's, uh, it'll start up much colder. So uh, one of the things you can do is if you survey a large uh, body of stars and find all these planets and because of direct imaging you can actually measure the temperature of the planet because you're, you're resolving the planet and you're looking at its spectrum uh, then you can, you can get its temperature and then you know the age of the star and then you can start putting data on these theoretical plots here. Right? So we know uh, 
beta pick is 10 Jupiter masses because it's also been detected radio velocity. Uh, and we know the inclination now because of direct imaging. Uh, so we can place beta pick B on sort of these hot start uh, track models. Uh, so that's very exciting because then GPI could is sensitive enough to a lot of these hot start planets, right? Because hot start uh, planets are going to be uh, hotter and brighter, uh, so that makes them easier to detect. Okay. So <clears throat> again, we can bring this back together in that uh, we want to understand the planetary systems. How do they evolve? How do the planets interact with disks? Uh, how do the uh, planets relate to the stars that they form out of? Uh, so that we can get a better understanding of planetary systems. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the instrument itself, GPI, and how that works. Uh, so first of all, uh, it's, it's uh, native to Victoria. It's uh, overall structure and its optics were put together at NRC Herzberg, just up the hill here. Uh, and then it's uh, IFS, or Internal uh, Integral Field Spectrograph, uh, which I'll talk about. Uh, was put together in UCLA and LA. Uh, then they were uh, both made it together at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, and this is where I first got to see GPI in the lab. Uh, it was in a, in a clean room. Uh, and then it got put on a 747, flown down to Santiago, uh, and then from Santiago it up to La Serena, and then into the Chilean Andes, uh, where it went to Gemini South uh, on Cerro Cacho. Okay. Now, why, why go to the Southern Hemisphere? Well, if you haven't been, this is what the Southern sky looks like. Right? You can see Orion up here, and he's upside down. So you know it's in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and you can see the large Magellanic cloud here, small Magellanic cloud here. Um, but what you really get is a, a huge density of stars. It's much more dense than uh, the Northern Hemisphere. And on top of that, a lot of uh, recent star forming regions are in uh, uh, the southern hemisphere, so they're more easily visible as you're getting more of the, the Milky Way galaxy. And when we want to find these uh, hot, uh, potentially hot or cold planets, the best time to find them is right after they formed, uh, when they're very young. Okay. So this is Gemini South, uh, so it's eight year mirror. Uh, so Impressive thing to see. This is a person standing right here, and this is full mirror, right? It would dwarf this building here. Uh, and see, this is uh, this is me standing right here. This platform goes up like two stories, and then this is another maybe two, three stories up to the secondary secondary mirror. And this is G Pi itself, again with me for scale. Uh, and this. Box enclosure here is about the size of a refrigerator, right? And then this is where all the, the adaptive optics, the integral field spectrograph, all the optics. This is where all this sits. And then these two boxes on the side here is where the cryo coolers are kept. Right? So it's an infrared detector, so you have to cool it down uh, to about 70 Kelvin, uh, so that you're sensitive to the infrared. Okay. And some of the special things about GPI. Uh, which make it a great instrument, uh, is really the extreme adaptive optics. Right? So by extreme adaptive optics, you have a Strel ratio of 90%. A Strel ratio is basically uh, a ratio determining how uh, good your instrument is, say, compared to if it was in space. Right? So 100% Strel ratio would be you've taken that telescope and you put it in space. There's no atmospheric uh, distortion to the image. Uh, and by having a natural guide star, by virtue of looking at exoplanets, right, we're looking around other stars, and so we have a natural guide star which gets us uh, a really good AO correction and a very small field of view. Another thing it has is a Leo stock chronograph, which is uh, not particularly new, uh, but it's uh, a method of just blocking out the central starlight, uh, and then this Leo stop uh, uh, suppresses some of the diffracting light. Uh, so Whenever you put a, a hard edge in, um, like to block out some light, the light's going to try to diffract around that hard edge. Uh, and so by having this Leo stop, uh, you can suppress some of that. Uh, the other thing you do is apodize optics. So an example of that is over here. Um, so 
like I said before, the, if you put in a hard edge, you have that diffraction, but if instead you slowly diffuse from transparent to opaque, then uh, the diffraction goes way down. Right? So instead of putting in hard edges for the chronograph and all the optics, you just slowly diffuse it out. Uh, and, and by getting rid of the diffracted light, right, you're increasing your chances of being able to observe uh, a planet close in. Right? So you want to get rid of the light that's bouncing around the instrument and uh, taking up the field of view right around the star. Okay? And then you have the integral field spectrograph, where its basic idea is you have an image, uh, but then that's in a cube form. Right? So you have an image for the, the sky at a particular wavelength, and then you have multiple wavelengths stacked at that same image. Okay, so then, if you find a planet in there, then you can have a measure of its spectrum uh, across the infrared. Mm. So, just to go over some of the, the uh, pieces of GPI, right? You start up here uh, with the light comes into the telescope, and then it goes reflects off two different mirrors. And these are both deformable mirrors, so they change shape uh, in order to distort uh, the, the image. Uh, and one of the novel things about this is that it has two, which is one acts as a woofer and one acts as a tweeter. Right? So in, in audio language, um, that's essentially because you're having one speaker that's controlling low frequency fluctuations, you have another speaker that's controlling high frequency fluctuations. And that's the same analogous thing that they're doing here. They have one deformable mirror that has large pistons and large surface area to adjust to low frequency. And then they have a tweeter which has small variations but smaller pistons uh, to correct for the high frequency fluctuations. Okay, and the, the way you're able to correct for that is it's an infrared instrument, that's what we're interested in, but we take the visible light, send it off to a wavefront sensor to figure out how do we deform the mirror so that we make uh, the, the uh, incoming image uh, as perfect as we can to, in order to defeat the, the atmosphere. Okay. Uh, then it comes into the chronograph where we block out the, the starlight uh, and reduce some of the, the diffraction and the atomization of the optics. Uh, and then there's this calibration unit, and this is was designed for uh, solving a common path uh, problem. Uh, when what that means is that uh, your is, your AO wavefront sensor can correct for everything that's upstream of the light beam, right? So it's correcting for everything in the atmosphere, uh, but then everything downstream of it, it's not sensitive to. It doesn't know what's going on past the wavefront sensor. So there's this calibration unit to try to uh, take, uh, solve what's going on in the optics if there's any speckles being caused by imperfections and send that information back to the wavefront sensor to correct for it. Um, problem is, right now that doesn't really work. It's sort of like a million dollar counterweight at this point. But uh, the, the hardware is, is sound. It's just don't have a really good understanding of how to loop that information back in. Uh, so that's an ongoing, uh, uh, issue and something that will continue to work on. Um, but right now, even with all of this, GPI is 10 times better than anything else I was observing on sky, so it's advantageous to just go out there and ask the scientific questions you have and then come back and uh, figure out what you actually need to do to correct And so then there's the IFS, which I'll go into. Uh, so this is a basic breakdown of what's going on. Is you have the light from the chronograph, blocking the central starlight and the, the secondary arms from Gemini South. And you send that light through some mirrors, you get to this lens load array. And lens load array, what that does is it's, it's a bunch of lenses that are tightly packed together. And so it'll take a section of the image uh, that you're bringing to a focus and, and then converts that just to a spot. And so it just take, collects all the light in that spot. And then it sends that into a spectrograph which can have a uh, Wollaston prism or a uh, traditional refractory prism. Uh, and what the, the prism then does is then takes that spot and then disperses it onto the, to the detector. Okay? And so if you look at the spectra here, you see that there for the lenslets collecting this little area here, and then the, lens, uh, the prism disperses that light as a function of wavelength onto the detector. So what the, the CMOS detector actually sees when you take an image is all these uh, lines and dots on, on the detector. Right? So you're not actually seeing uh, 
what the image is brought to a focus on the lens layer array, you're seeing this uh, convoluted interpretation of what uh, that is. And then you have to apply an extraction algorithm to then uh, actually analyze what is the, the light on those images to take the spectra of each lenslet and then convert that into a data cube that you actually can do science with. Okay, and then the Wollaston prism, um, right, if you don't know a polarized light, uh, the basic idea is that um, right, light behaves like a wave, so uh, there's a particular orientation that that electric field vector in the photon can have. Okay, and what we can do is we can measure the relative brightness between these two spots, and we actually determine uh, the orientation of the electric field vector, and that's important for studying the Brides, which I'll come back to. So when you do all that, when you reconstruct a data cube, this is what you get, right? So this is uh, an image of beta pic B. You actually can see beta pic B in there. It's a sort of bit like playing where's Waldo. You don't really know where it is in this because there's all these little speckles in here. Um, but just to talk about some of the features you can see is, is this box where you have the, the bright corners and it's a little bit darker on the inside of here. And that's caused by the, the formal mirror is essentially the, it's what they call the dark hole. It's where you have the most correction and so you're, you can see the most faint uh, things in this uh, box region. Uh, the other thing you do is you uh, can see these uh, four spots, they're called satellite spots. And uh, what they are is a copy of the star image in all of those four corners. And what they're doing is they're purposefully diffracting the image uh, to put the four uh, copies in the image. Um, right? But we're trying to get rid of all this diffracting light, so why do we purposely diffract it? Well. There's two uh, main things we're trying to do with this. So the, the star itself, when we're, we observe a planet, we want to know exactly the separation between the planet and the star so that we can observe, uh, determine its orbital parameters around the star. Okay. Uh, but the problem is if we put the star behind the chronograph, we don't know what the star is anymore. Right? But if we know uh, that the, the relative position of these four spots, you can actually triangulate where the star is underneath the chronograph. Okay. Uh, so even with any pointing uncertainty, we know where the star is. Uh, and then the, the second piece uh, of why they do this is, uh, is you want to be able to flux calibrate uh, the image. right? You want to know how bright the planet actually is after it's passed through all the AO system, after it's gone through the extraction algorithm to get the light off the detector. Um, so after it's done all that, you want to know how bright the planet actually is. But we know that the satellite spots are roughly 10,000 times dimmer than the central star that it's a copy of. So by knowing that, we can then measure the counts of, on the image and then compare that to what we know the brightness of the, the star is in whatever band we're observing, like JH or K and infrared. Uh, and then we can solve for what the brightness of the planet that we observe is. Okay, so how do we actually then find the planet itself. Well, there's a, several techniques of post-processing that, that, go, that it goes through in order to actually find the planet. Uh, so what this is, is showing angle, angular differential imaging. Uh, and you can see the planet here is moving within the image. Okay? And what causes that is when you're uh, observing uh, a star as it's uh, rising and setting, right? your field of view is rotating if you have an altitude azimuth tels telescope. Right? If it's an equatorial mount, you won't see this at all. Uh, but Gemini South is alt as as most large telescopes are, just for engineering purposes. Uh, and most of the time, you'll have a rotator that actually rotates the instrument to correct for this. Uh, but instead, we just turn that off and then just let the field of view rotate as we're observing it as a transit. And so what that does is then we separate the signal from the noise, right? We're, we're seeing the astrophysical source moving, but this, the, every, all the static speckles uh, are, are going to go away and subtract. Okay. The other thing we do is uh, spectral differential imaging. Right? And this relies on the fact that diffracting <laughs> light, uh, the angle at which it diffracts changes based on the function of wavelength. Right? And we have this data cube, so we know uh, 
what the light is doing as a function of wavelength. Okay? So you can see that the, the light is, that's diffracted is moving out in wavelength as we go to longer and longer wavelengths. Uh, but beta pig B, right here, uh, because it's out at infinity relative to the telescope, uh, it's just going to come in and be static within the image. The other technique uh, we employ is polarization differential imaging. Uh, and this really only works on uh, debridis in particular, because debridis are, are polarized. Uh, and essentially the reason they're polarized is because you, it's a reflecting system. It's, the light is reflecting off of the dust, and so it becomes uh, preferentially aligned to its reflection angle. Okay. And so if you know the starlight itself is unpolarized, at least most stars are unpolarized, uh, and uh, we characterize the instrument very well because a telescope is a reflecting system, so it has some inherent polarization. Uh, but that should be static, we can characterize that. Uh, you can see that when we pull out the polarized intensity image, we get a much better image than uh, just stacking the images uh, from total intensity. Um, so we can, we can suppress a lot of that extra diffracting light that's around the chronograph and then bring out the structure of the disk. Uh, the other thing you notice is that uh, it looks very different, right? You get a crescent here and a full ring here, right? Um, and what that is, uh, is due to is the scattering function of the grains. Um, so it's, uh, it's either uh, more advantageous uh, for forward scattering or back scattering, depending on the grain properties. Uh, so that, uh, if you can figure out the orientation, that tells you something uh, important about dust grains themselves, right? So it, it tells you about uh, dust grain size as well as their porosity. And porosity is um, uh, just, is, it, is the grain very compact? Is it a compact sphere or is it sort of a fluffy uh, structure with lots of wings coming out of it, okay? So, uh, and that's important because then that can have implications on uh, how we think dust grains coagulate to then form planets, right? So it's a, it's a direct way of measuring these properties that we're interested in in order to figure out planet formation. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about uh, some of the survey results. Uh, that, uh, so the survey's been going uh, for a few years now, I think two years, uh, and we're only halfway through the survey. Uh, we're really getting dogged down by El Nino because uh, it gets rid of all the good clear nights. Um, but uh, some of the results uh, have been impressive. So this is Beta Pig B again, known planet, uh, but we can actually observe it over a long period of time. And so uh, the motion you're seeing there is actually due to orbital motion, right? So you're seeing the planet uh, at, on its orbit as it's going in closer to the star because you're seeing the system edge on. Right? Wow. So uh, one of the cool things we learned about this and, and being able to really accurately know the, the orbit of the planet, uh, we know that the planet uh, won't actually transit. It was thought that maybe it's an edge on system, maybe it'll transit, uh, but its uh, uh, hill sphere will transit the, the central star. And what the hill sphere is, is basically the region in which uh, the planet is most dominant. So if there's any moons or circumplanetary disk, um, uh, that would be within the, the hill sphere. So there's a potential that uh, we could be able to observe some sort of moon or, or disk in transit uh, as the planet goes across. Um, so we've also been able to discover uh, new planets uh, so this example is 51 area B. Uh, you can see it's right here at this, where this white arrow is. You can see it, it sort of pops in and out of detection. We don't actually observe it in these long, and you can see that actually helps distinguish it from uh, the instrumental effects, right? Because all this speckle effect uh, is, uh, has a particular uh, spectrum that's really mostly indicative of the star itself. Where the planet is a much colder object that has a very different spectrum. And so that allows us to help differentiate what's a speckle in the image and what's actually a planet. Uh, and what causes this large peak uh, is actually uh, a methane. 
right? So this is an artist's impression of what the planet might actually look like. It looks very much like Jupiter, uh, in the sense that we know Jupiter has very uh, thick methane uh, that's in the banding structure. Uh, it's very red, it's very bright, uh, it's a very warm planet, uh, as it's newly formed. Uh, and it's also part of a trinary system, there's an M dwarf stop here, uh, and then 51-year B is here. And so it, it's uh, particularly interesting in that uh, by having the spectrum and knowing what the, the atmosphere is composed of, we can start making educated guesses about uh, what the, so the mass is. We expect this is something about uh, two Jupiter masses, uh, which would make it the lowest mass planet ever directly imaged. Uh, it could potentially be up to six Jupiter masses, because the models are a little bit uh, being worked on, right? they're mostly theoretical. Um, uh, but it's, it's potentially interesting that we're discovering new planets, that we can learn more about uh, planetary systems with it. Uh, and then just some of the follow-up that's been done is we can already start to see orbital motion. Uh, it's uh, moving um, like left to right here, so uh, it's probably not an edge-on system, it's probably not going to transit. Uh, what it'll probably do is have some very long orbit, it's out at 17 AU, so it could take decades for it to eventually make a full circle. Uh, but within maybe five years' time, we should have a strong enough in our arc that we could fit the planetary orbit, and we know very precisely uh, how the planet orbits the central star. Uh, some other results I'm going to talk about is uh, HD 106906. Uh, and this is a Debrita system that's seen sort of edge on. Uh, you can see uh, it's sort of an arc here, and so that you're seeing that if you imagine like most Debritas are sort of like ring structures, and so it's very edge on. You might be able to see the back side of it. Uh, there's some uncertainty on this warp. Is it an instrumental effect or? don't really line up very well with this side going to this side. Eventually there's a uh, uh, warp in the disk, so it's not a perfect ring structure. Uh, you also see it's asymmetric, uh, so we have the bright side over here and the dim side over here. Uh, and it's at, the ring itself is about 46 AU, so it's comparable to about our Kuiper belt. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a lot younger system, so it's basically a Kuiper belt that's still collisionally active, creating a lot of dust, and causing this emission. Uh, what's also interesting about this system is it's already known to have an exoplanet. But its exoplanet was discovered by HST, uh, and it was actually found way out here, uh, and the center star is down here. Right? So it's something around like 600 AU from the star. Hmm. And so it's thought that this planet was actually ejected uh, from the system. Uh, uh, and what's also noticeable about this image, right, is HST, the chronograph of HST is this gray circle here. And GPI is observing entirely within uh, that chronograph, right? Uh, so we're just completely blowing HST out of the water, uh, mostly because it's, it's an eight meter mirror, but you have this extreme AO system, which is taking it to 90% strel. And so it's practically in space already then. So you basically have this 8 meter mirror in space, whereas HST is something like 2 meters. Uh, so the image resolution is, is way different. Uh, but you can also see that there's a streamer uh, coming out in HST. This sort of lines up with the GPI image. Uh, so we're seeing some maybe faint uh, dust coming out from the disk. Uh, and uh, it's also asymmetric in HSTs, right? So we're seeing it mostly predominantly on the side. Uh, and so it's interesting to, to think about what could be causing this asymmetry in the disk. And so some people have, have simulated, well, if you have this planet as, as still bound to the system, uh, maybe then when this planet interacts with the disk, you can actually disrupt the disk. And so you can cause this sort of asymmetry as a streamer of material gets pulled off. Uh, maybe you cause that warp in the disk. Um, some of the, the issues with a model like this is if you say it's ejected, right, it probably started from the inner part of the disk, right, because it, it likely formed in what we know is there's a gap in the disk. So we know that it likely probably formed there, was denser, uh, and easy, easier to form a massive planet. Uh, and 
having something form way out here is very improbable because it's very, uh, very diffuse. And so if you ejected it from the star, it should come back to roughly about the star. Um, so, so this model implies that it was, the planet was actually formed out here. Now potentially you could have um, uh, stars in the neighborhood which uh, tugged on the planet when it was out here. Uh, and that, that caused it to have a different orbit when it came back. Um, but this is, this is, again, something we want to study to, to really understand the interaction between planets, uh, the Redis, and the stars. Okay, so another system I'll highlight here is uh, HD 11520. Uh, this is a system uh, I worked on, uh, and it's particularly remarkable in that it has an asymmetry, but it's one of the strongest we've ever seen, and that it's, it's a two to one asymmetry. Right, so the brightness in the northwest side up here is plotted here, and then the southeast side down here is plotted here. And so throughout the disk, there's this two to one asymmetry. Uh, and if you imagine a Doritos, as in the traditional sense, is how we've all imagined it uh, in the field, is that you have this <coughs> ring of material. Um, but it, uh, to get some sort of asymmetry that that's that strong, uh, and still have relatively consistent structure across it, it's sort of mind boggling. How do you actually do that? Uh, and there's some weird features in here, like these uh, bumps uh, of emission. Uh, these might be some artifacts. Uh, we, we try out different algorithms to do the PSF subtraction. So when we got those data cubes, we had to try the different tricks in order to bring out uh, the astrophysical signal. So maybe these are artifacts. Um, but it's interesting that we get this, this peak of emission on the southeast side. Maybe that's telling us it's, it's clumping there or something. Uh, one of the other things uh, we observed is in, uh, the polarized light, right? So you can also see in the polarized light, we also have this asymmetry. The southeast side is much dimmer than the northwest side. Uh, and so what that's telling us is that the, the grain properties are roughly consistent. So the, the scattering function that causes the polarization is, is consistent across because we see it in relative intensity between the total intensity and, and polarized intensity is roughly consistent, so the scattering function is roughly the same across. Uh, and if the grain properties are consistent, then that ex uh, uh, would not explain the asymmetry. Because uh, you can imagine if you have really large grains on one side and small grains on the other side, that might cause it. Uh, but uh, you can imagine it, there would be something much more uh, dynamic going on that's causing this asymmetry. Uh, so you can see some other examples uh, of di disks that have been observed. Uh, and really, we're finding a lot more disks than planets. Right? So there's some debate about calling it the Gemini disk imager rather than planet imager. Uh, but uh, you can see a lot of the structure that we're starting to see, and that uh, a lot of these, what we've assumed uh, for a long time is these sort of narrow rings, uh, like HR 47X6, uh, there's actually a lot more structure, right? You can have multiple rings. Uh, uh, you can have uh, uh, strong, uh, you have symmetric disks, but very strong in the center, weaker to the outside. Uh, you can have, again, other asymmetries, right? This is a really zoomed in view. Uh, this beta pic uh, disk, so it's, again, it's a really zoomed in view of the disk rather than that very large view of the disk uh, we saw earlier. Uh, you see even some of the spiral features in some of the disks. So these are, are uh, this, these two stars here are really um, young stars, uh, such that they're probably uh, still have gas in their disks, and that uh, gas is probably influencing uh, the dust in the disk to cause these sort of pressure bumps. Uh, it can also be uh, there's the theories about. Uh, stars that are in binaries, if you have an M dwarf that's outside of the disk, and that can sort of excite a uh, spiral arm as well. Um, but really, we're starting to see uh, a much more uh, diverse uh, set of structures in, in the disk. Uh, and really, even though we're not finding as many planets, uh, we can still start to infer things about what's going on in these systems to cause these uh, structures in the disk. So if we don't see the planet, but we see its, its influence on the disk, we start to infer things about uh, the planetary system itself. Okay, so uh, with that, the 
eventual goal is to then uh, really develop a more complete understanding of, of exoplanetary systems and, and how they evolve uh, by looking at not just uh, planets, but also the disks and the stars themselves and understanding the relationships that those three components really have with each other. Okay, with that, I'll take questions. Fantastic. This is just so, so amazing. You know, you, you, you're too young to realize how amazing this actually is. is like, you get to do science fiction for your PhD research. <laughs> and uh, so I'm wondering, maybe you can look ahead. Do you think maybe in your lifetime that, metaphorically speaking, uh, you or a successor will be taking pictures of little green men? Little green men? Um, <laughs> yeah. Some evidence. Yeah, I, that's a, it's a tough one um, because right now we're we're observing mostly gas giants, right? So those it's hard to imagine uh, life forming on a gas giant, maybe a moon around a gas giant, but uh, finding a terrestrial, being able to directly image a terrestrial mass planet is really the goal. Uh, and if we can have a spectrum of that that planet, and then we can look for biosignatures, and then that would be the biggest thing of, of finding it in Little Green Men. Um, that's maybe within my lifetime. Uh, with JWST, the, the satellite that's going to replace Hubble, uh, the idea is that you could observe a transit system and then try to get its spectrum. And then you can maybe look at a, a Earth mass planet. So that might pay off. Uh, as far as direct imaging, there's plans <coughs> to do uh, direct imaging around Alpha Centauri. Uh, and there's Lots of cool tricks you can do um, in order to actually observe an Earth mass planet around Alpha Centauri. And it's a lot easier because it's very close to us. Um, so maybe that'll pan out. Um, so there's, within my lifetime, yeah, there's a few options that could potentially pan out to getting, uh, finding life around another planet. Maybe a few things that we don't even know about yet. That's that true. Could become, because we didn't know about this stuff. 20 years ago. So. Yeah, that's right. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, it appears as though you're looking at relatively large uh, debris disks or uh, uh, planets that are pretty far out. What the resolution of this instrument? How close? How many AU can you get before you really, you know, you lose resolution? So uh, there are some systems we can get down to about five AU in scale. Really? So that's down to a Jupiter. And so that's really hard to do, uh, and ultimately we're limited by how many systems are actually out there that we can actually observe. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's probably the lower limit. 5 AU is probably the limit for a Jupiter size. Yeah, mm. and so you know we're observing something that's two Jupiter masses, and so that's right on our edge of detectability. So uh, I think the, one of the driving goals of the instrument was to get down to a Jupiter, right? a Jupiter mass, 5 AU. Uh, but typically, we're still going to be more sensitive to objects farther out and higher mass. Long ways from Earth-sized habitable zone kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, given that you can virtually beat the uh, the atmospheric distortions with with this kind of uh, system, yep. what's the relative advantages now of, of space-based? instruments compared to, because I, I'm assuming they both have some uses, but I don't know. Yeah, so it's sort of changed the game a little bit. Right. So what we're really limited to, to in Extreme AO is we need a natural guide star, uh, and we can make those corrections, but on a very, very tiny field of view. Right? So it's fine if you're, okay. you're interested in planets, you can read us, right? It's right around the star. But if you want to do a wide field image of of some nebula structure or multiple stars at a time in a large survey, um, you, you can't really do that. And so it only works at getting a really good correction right around the star itself. Mm -hmm. So it really lends itself to this particular science. <coughs> uh, we're still going to need space-based observations to uh, get wider field views, uh, do larger surveys, and that sort of thing. Thank you. Are you uh, confident enough in the description of our own disk 
vis-a-vis uh, looking at others, and if so, why can't you find Planet Nine using the same sorts of things that you talked about, the distortion of the disk? Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, there's grad students here at UVic who are actually trying to address the Planet Nine issue, uh, and the, basically the problem they run into is that so the Planet Nine was discovered basically because of there's this weird uh, uh, orbital parameters that are, are uh, a grouping of orbital parameters of certain objects that we know of. Right? So that was proposed as evidence for Planet Nine. Uh, and so uh, what you really have to do is then simulate a system with a planet uh, and all the objects that we know and see does that match the observations. Does a planet start to perturb the disk so much that we start losing objects that we know are there. Uh, and so that's sort of uh, what's being uh, researched right now. Um, so, so yes, uh, we are basically doing uh, that to look at our own solar system. Uh, and, uh, and our solar system is, is maybe, uh, it's, it's a bit more evolved. So our, our debris disk essentially is is fairly diffuse, its density has dropped way down. Uh, so these other systems we observe, um, uh, we have a lot better tracer of the overall structure. So we're not seeing individual asteroids and comets, we're, like, we're seeing this uh, field of, of dust that's being created by those bodies. Um, so yeah, so. Uh, what about the uh, uh, kind of comparing your information with that that would be gathered by ALMA? some other device like that? Is there any plans to do that sort of work? Yeah, so, uh, so my advisor, she mostly works on uh, interferometry, uh, and that's exactly what we're looking to do. I was just at a conference a few weeks ago where uh, we were talking about merging fields, essentially, merging high contrast imaging and uh, submillimeter interferometry, uh, because they, they are overlapping quite well in, in science levels, right? You want to understand the structure of a disk, uh, and you can do that really well with an interferometer and radio because uh, you get that uh, dust emission uh, really well. Um, being able to observe a planet is really hard to do uh, in, with all the, uh, you basically have to really see it forming in the disk itself for it to be bright enough and sensitive to, to all uh, uh, But yeah, in the future, so some of these objects we see with G5, we're proposing to follow up with Alma uh, because you also get a lot of information by having two different wavelength regimes. Uh, so uh, in the radio, you're, you're sensitive to larger grains, uh, whereas in the infrared and optical, we're seeing a lot of those lighter dust grains. Uh, and so they'll be perturbed in different ways by planets or stellar flybys and things like that. Uh, and so we can use that multi-wavelength information to figure out which snares are more likely. Is there plans to put a G5 on, say, the Gemini North or some other uh, satellite? Uh, yeah, so uh, there's talk of actually moving G5 once it's done its survey in the south. Uh, because there's uh, only so many uh, stars bright enough and uh, young enough to really be worth going after, uh, they'll eventually, after the end of the survey, hit the point of, well, we've got nothing left to observe. Uh, so the, there's talk of uh, taking GPI back either to Stanford or here in Victoria, uh, updating it a bit, and then sending it to Gemini North, uh, where it can start observing other targets that it just couldn't observe. All right, anyone else? Okay, so uh, just a story. I used to lecture on other planetary systems in the days when we all thought that Peter Van der Kamp had shown that Barnard's star had one. Yeah. And I, I used to emphasize the care that went into the measurement of the position of Barnard's star mm -hmm. and how Peter van der Kamp had uh, uh, accumulated observations over 25 years. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to convey uh, uh, an idea of the, the patience and the skill that was needed to do this until one day I encountered someone who said, didn't he have something better to do with his life than make those little measurements for 25 years? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, well, that's, that's 
that's the field of astronomy in general, right? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody always asks you why, why do it. Uh, you know, I, I think something with like uh, in planets and planet formation, right? It's really about putting uh, putting ourselves in, in con a greater context, right? Uh, how is how is our system going to evolve? Are our comets really impactful in in causing life on Earth or uh, is there no correlation with with that? Um, uh, what? How unique is our system, right? Is it is it really common that you have terrestrial planets here and then you have gas giants over here uh, and debris between them, uh, or are they much more chaotic? Right? I mean, it's it's putting putting ourselves in a, in a greater context so we know just how special we are, really, and that that really applies to everybody.